Hey, what's up? This is Kevin from Kevin's Barbecue Joints, and in this episode, I get a chance to talk to Tim McKeska from McKeska Brands. He's also from the McKeska family, which has a deep, deep history in Texas barbecue. They're the, known as the first family of Texas barbecue. We get into his family history. We get into his history. They're, they were butchers, and they were restaurant owners, and catering on a grand scale, and he was catering on a grand scale. So we talk about his entire history, what he's doing now, his McKeska brands, which does incredible sausage, and they ship wholesale to restaurants across the United States. So we get deep into that. He's also standing in the beginning in front of a piece of bison, and he explains all the different cuts of meat, and uh, it's that's fascinating, and the history of those those meats when it comes to Texas barbecue. Then we get a tour of his facility, and then at the very end, I have an actual video of them manufacturing uh, sausage at his facility. It's, it's killer. I don't want to talk too much because there's so much to get into. I know you're going to enjoy this. Uh, Please let me know what you think in the comments below. Please subscribe. I'll be adding at least one video, if not two, per week. Enjoy this. Well, good afternoon, Tim. How are you doing? I'm wonderful here in the hill country of uh, Texas. I have a beautiful hill country of Texas and enjoying a, a day of gut. Any day I get to cut meat, Kevin's a good day. <laughs> it is. You're the first person who's actually been cutting meat while I, or in, in the process of cutting meat while I did an interview. So this is phenomenal. We love this. This is great. Well, well I stopped. But uh, to, to do this interview, but uh, I've got some bison here behind me, American bison, buffalo. Okay. And I thought I could point out some things that uh, maybe make sense to people in the barbecue business. I think that'd be great. Do you want to do want to jump into that now? Then we'll go sure. head into the sure. meeting. Excellent. Uh, you know, up until you know, we'll talk a little bit about my history later. But up until uh, the late '60s, early '70s, you didn't have the the pleasure like you have now of opening up box beef and seeing briskets. And things like that, all nice and cry back. Prior to the, at 72, I believe, uh, we still got brisket on the chuck plate here. And this is the four quarter. Okay. This is a call four primals to an animal. You have the, the chuck primal, which is one that goes to the fifth, between the fifth and sixth rib here. This is the, uh, being the fifth rib. And then you have the rib primal. And then you have the loin primal. And then you have the round primal. Okay. So this is your brisket right here. And this is the buffalo. Now, this is totally different if it was, you know, a big wagyu sitting over here or <laughs> gang. You have this beautiful, thick, rich, white fat. But this is a, if you can see all the yellow fat on this right here, why is it yellow? You look at all that yellow fat right here. Yes, sir. Why is it yellow? This is a grass fed animal. Okay. White, it'd be nice and white and creamy. It would be, obviously, it would be, you know, uh, finished on grain. But this is grass fed. So your brisket is right here behind the arm. It's here on the breastplate. It goes from the start, from the sternum all the way to the fifth and sixth rib. Okay. Well, that's perfect. That's the brisket. But I wanted to show this to you today. And, and in the old days, this is how it came. It would come arm off, which is this arm off over here, mm -hmm. and it would come on this entire plate. And my dad would peel these briskets off, and then all of this is this very now expensive chuck rib that people are making very expensive, would be discarded into sausage or into a hamburger. And then the chuck roll, I wanted to emphasize this chuck roll here. Okay. The ribeye starts right here and would go to about right there on the backbone of the animal. My father would take this chuck, the center cut chuck, and make what we call club steaks. Because my, my family had, my mom, my mom and dad had four barbecue restaurants in one town, another barbecue restaurant in another town, a 24-hour restaurant in Georgetown near Taylor, and then it had a fine dining Taylor Country Club. So he would take these chuck steaks okay. from the and then he would make steaks out of that. And then everything else would go to sausage. Now, my dad did not live long enough, unfortunately, to see the value of these. <laughs> I don't know how he would have handled it, uh, Kevin, because he did live long enough to, to see what happened on uh, the flank, which is mm -hmm. all that's pita. He couldn't believe that they, people were in the, in the 80s buying this fajita meat for $1.49 a pound. It's three pounds. But I don't know what he would do. These chuck ribs are going for about nineteen fifty a pound in restaurants. And then the plate rib, which is the continuation of that rib, is going for $25 a pound. Oh, I know. It's phenomenal. And, and back then, Kevin, these all just went into trim. The people in the grocery stores wouldn't buy them. So what do you think? What do you think he would say? What would his impression be? 
he, I think he'd wish he was, he had all that back <laughs> all that started and that we could have done it all over again. And, you know, in the two thousands and, and, and get $25 a pound. Mm -hmm. for it. Uh, I know when he had the fajita, when the fajita came about and I got him some, he said, son, you know, that's, that's just flank steak, right? That's all the, that's all the flap meat. Mm -hmm. And I said, I know exactly what it is. And they're doing what with it? I said, yeah, that, you know, it's a pretty big thing to add. <laughs> I don't know how you handle that. <laughs> now that you said that's a that, that's a chuck steak. Is that what that is? That uh, this is the chuck. This is the chuck rib. <laughs> chuck rib. And then what's the steak? Some barbecue, that the... Some barbecue places. There's two different ribs that some okay. of the barbecue places use. Uh, some of them use this chuck portion, which is a smaller rib, mm -hmm. and then some use the plate. The next part of that rib is the plate, and if you bear with me at the end of this video, we'll go in the cooler okay. and I'll show you what those look like, and you'll see the difference. Excellent. I wanted, I wanted to show you that. That we got, we had to get creative about four or five years ago when, when these fast food restaurants started getting in the barbecue business. You remember that? Uh huh. Don't do that. <laughs> Please. Right. I'm not going to get in the fast food restaurant business if you don't get, and you know who I'm talking to you, those companies out there. Tim McKesk is begging you not to get into the barbecue business and take all of our briskets. Please. When they did that, we had to get creative because briskets got in short supply. And so one of the things that we did is we started taking this chuck roll, mm -hmm. cooking it like a brisket. You've heard of the shoulder plot? Oh, yeah. Great, great, I great, think some of the places Lockhart, right? Lockhart prices, used it for many, many mm -hmm. years. That's everything from here to here with the arm off. Okay. Okay, that's everything in here. And there's also, there's two interesting pieces of meat right in this, in, in this shoulder right here. Right here, you have the, uh, this part right here is the flat iron. Mm -hmm. If I was to remove this, you would have the flat iron steak. Oh. That's what you make famous on their flat iron. And this little piece of meat that's right here is the mock tender, which is another piece of meat that looks like a tenderloin that's right here. So we were cooking the chuck roll. Okay. We were trying the mock tender, the flat iron, and we also, behind this, is a terrace major. If you've ever heard of a terrace major, mm -hmm. that's other muscle in behind here. So we were having to do all these things because the briskets got short. So don't get in, you guys in the, in, in, in the uh, fast food restaurant, don't do that, please. <laughs> what do you think the guys, what, what do you think the guys would have to do, the, the restaurants nowadays, if they had to break that thing down, do you think they'd be able to serve as many briskets as they serve, like some of the ones that serve 50, 60? It would not be easy. <laughs> it would be a lot of work. But at the same time, they would learn a lot. True. At the same time as they would probably make their own sausage. Because that's why, you know, when I talk to you a little bit about the history of my family, you know, we were, we were meat. We, I mean, if Wikipedia had an article about Texas barbecue, I was going to say encyclopedia, but I don't even think you, you know, they have it anymore. <laughs> but if Wikipedia that's kind of a shame. <laughs> article on Texas barbecue, I think my family would be a perfect example. Mm-hmm. Because they came over from Moravia uh, at the turn of the century, which is the Czech lands. I like a lot of German families and a lot of other Czech families, and they had the skills of being butchers. And in my family's case, in the 1900, early 1900s, my grandfather ran a beef club. And what the beef club was, yeah. he would go out amongst all the farms and butcher their animals. And then for his payment, he would take part of the animal. Oh, huh. and th so my family was never, they had no money. My dad said, we didn't even know what money was, but they weren't hungry because they had those skills of a, being a butcher. And did they move to Taylor oh. originally? Was it in Taylor or was it not? Yeah, it was in Taylor, yes. In the, uh, they came to Taylor about 1910, uh, but they were in Central Texas uh, in around 1890 in that okay. area. And they, they made Taylor their home around 1910, 1915. What drove them so, to Taylor, dude? Oh. <laughs> you really want to know? Uh, sure, why not? <laughs> yeah, they, they, they were actually coming over to learn the cotton business. They want to learn the cotton business. Okay. They were from the Czech lands of Eastern Europe, uh, 1880, 1890, learned all the cotton business. They got on, they went, there were three months on a boat. They left you know, Bremen, Germany out of Czechoslovakia, or not when you Czechoslovakia, when you then Moravia. They get on a boat for three months, Kevin. Okay? They're on a boat for three months, okay? No one can imagine get, that at all. <laughs> yeah. They get on a train in in a Galveston, they come in through Galveston, they didn't come in through New York, and they were on their way to West Texas to learn the cotton business. Okay. The train stops in Granger, Texas. Now, do you know where Granger, Texas is? 
I've heard of that. I don't know specifically where it is. Grange was just north of Taylor. Okay. Great little Czech community. They got off the train because they saw this sign that said saloon. <laughs> and the train had to take on water. They get out. They haven't had a beer in three months. And they get in that saloon and they, they see people that speak their language. They see the rich farmland. They see a church. They see all the things that they need. And they also saw that great beer they were drinking that was nice and cold, and the train left. <laughs> they never made it to San Angelo That's to make so their cotton business, but some of them did. Okay. But they settled in Central Texas, so they missed the train. They were in a bar. <laughs> That's a great story. That is fantastic. And so, so what happened is after the meat club business, after they were in the meat club business, my father managed a grocery store meat market when he was 16. Okay. 16 years old, he managed a meat market. That's how butchers they were. And all my other uncles went to World War II. My dad followed them. And then my dad was a meat and dairy inspector during World War II. All six McKeska boys saw combat okay. in both World War II and Korea, Korea. except my dad. My dad was a meat and dairy inspector, so he fought the war on bacteria. <laughs> That's a great life. <laughs> he, said, he, said he, he said he killed millions of germs every day because he was... Hopefully, he was feeding his brothers uh, when they were packaging food for overseas. No, that's important. Said, it's integral. Very important. Yeah. Very important. Yeah. So my dad comes back from World War II, and my grandparents ran a country club in Taylor, Taylor Country Club, fine dining establishment. So he started there uh, learning the fine dining business and combining with his butcher skills. Okay. And he expanded their business. And then in 1950 or so, he, uh, he bought out the Novosad family in Taylor. There's a Novosad still operating down in Hallettsville. Well, at that time, he was in Taylor. Okay. My dad bought his restaurants out, and then dad expanded those. And then at the same time, he had the l &M Cafe in Georgetown, a 24-hour service restaurant, oh. four barbecues in Taylor. Four barbecues, Kevin, in one town, <laughs> one, and then the Taylor Country Club, and then the largest catering business in Central Texas. <laughs> That's phenomenal. That's amazing. That's how I was born. People ask me, why aren't you in the restaurant business anymore? Yeah, you've lived it. <laughs> <laughs> Second day on earth, I was put in a meat box with a bunch of bar towels, and the bartender told him to watch that. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. The barbecue restaurants at the beginning, when he when he opened them, what were they serving? What was different? Was it wasn't exactly the same thing as what you're serving? What so no, you were serving mostly, later on, right? Mostly brisket. Okay. Uh, it was brisket and sausage. Sausage was our number one seller, and it was the one that we pushed the most on because we had the most profit margin. Gotcha. Remember what I said about all the uh -huh. We had those beef ribs. If I put a beef rib on a plate in 1970, they wouldn't they wouldn't have taken they wouldn't have eaten it. <laughs> so sausage was our probably our number one seller, followed by brisket and and then pork ribs, believe it or not, was probably one of our worst sellers. We did sell pork ribs. Okay. But we never sold pork cushion meat, which I mean we didn't sell pulled pork, pork. How quickly you were probably cleaning tables at a young age, you were probably, you're doing everything, right? Yeah, my father had a unique uh, view on the child labor laws. Uh, <laughs> he had none. And, but he didn't either, because my, he told me a story one time, they were picking cotton. Uh, they're all young kids, and they were all pick all six brothers and three sisters were picking cotton, and they took a break one day, and grandpa would come out and said, look, I didn't have y'all sitting here underneath this tree and take a break, get out there and pick cotton. <laughs> so, but you know what, that is, the, I'm very proud of the way we were raised because that's how my cousins and I were all taught. Mm -hmm. uh, to work hard and to, to be productive. Yes, definitely. You, you, were, you, you weren't born into a lazy family at all. No, no, there was no quit in us. <laughs> there wasn't at all. So, so your, your early, the early part of your life was spent, were you, were you working in the restaurant or were you doing other things and working in the restaurant? Uh, I started... Well, I was playing around the restaurants a lot. We really didn't have tables to bust at the barbecue restaurants because okay. it was all sort of butcher paper. Uh, and if they didn't trust me at, at the restaurant in Georgetown, Texas, to bust tables because it was tip money. And uh, I guess, you know, for whatever reason, they didn't trust me with that. <laughs> and so what I did is I actually learned to debone chicken. We, we cooked a lot of fried chicken at that restaurant. Oh. So I was seven and eight years old. My father trusted me with deboning chicken. Okay. <laughs> at the restaurant, and at the barbecue restaurants, I was finally about seven years old. I was able to stack those old wooden Coke crates, mm -hmm. those old bottle crates. Were the uh, yellow, the yellow ones, or the yeah, the wooden ones. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
and I would stack them up to the stuffing table and I would start making sausage. Okay, I was going to ask if you started making sausage. Seven. I don't know anybody that started at seven years old. So he's been doing it for 20 years. Black, he'll probably tell you he did that too, you know. Oh, yeah? Kent Black started that. His family, we, we made a joke, Kent Black and I, one time at the NBBQA convention. I said, you know, we obviously, our parents had a different theory on child labor laws. <laughs> Yeah. And, and so did he, so he, he was making, they were making sausage at that young age too. I'm sure oh, he was, yeah, yeah. yeah. The black family and our family have a very similar history, except he was in, they had a grocery store. Uh, they actually owned a grocery okay. store that turned into the barbecue business. And what happened in this barbecue business is in my uncle's case, they had meat, they had meat shops, they had meat markets. Okay. And then their meat market was their barbecue place. And they made have five days of fresh meat Monday through Friday, and then on Saturday and Sunday, they would cook barbecue. Huh. It started to transfer over from the meat market. They were selling when, you know, when grocery stores came about and they had all of these, these, these cheaper cuts already done, it became, they were selling more barbecue than they were meat, and so then they became barbecue restaurants. And that's kind of like the history of Texas barbecue is, is that, that's it. Right? That's you, you guys are the epitome of Texas. Of, um, we, we will. If you still had an encyclopedia, we'd be in it. <laughs> you would for sure. So what t- what type of sausage were you making back then? Beef. Just they beef. made beef sausage. Yeah, I mean, they made it with everything from the from the rooter to the... <laughs> to the <laughs> it was the, the full, the full gamut. The gamut. Not good. Rooter. Tutor. Yes, exactly. So what they did is everything, the all fowl all went in there. Okay. And uh, and it was great sausage. It had tripe, which is the stomach oh, lining. Yeah, yeah. It had Great stuff. Uh, now we don't do any of that. In fact, I sometimes wonder what my dad would say about the sausage I'm commercially making because it's so pure. Mm-hmm. But that's what the customer demands. Oh, exactly. And it's not. And are, are, at that time, were, were people putting liver in sausage? Was that something like like the he- the Czechs were the Czechs and Germans were? There's a liverwurst, and, and oh, we true. have a sausage called Itranica, which is a a a, a uh, it's kind of like a Bohemian boudin okay. that's cooked liver, cooked hearts, and everything. And then put into a casing with, uh, uh, with I like to use rice, which makes it look like boudin. Mm-hmm. Uh, but they've used they, there was all always different things they could put in there for fillers. Uh, I personally like it with rice. But yes, there were other kinds of sausage that were being made, but most of it was beef until about the late eighties. Now, now I've got a, got a question. We're, at that time, I know right now we we know about all all the barbecue restaurants and the barbecue scene and what's going on. At that time, like, were you aware of other barbecue families or other people like big barbecue restaurants, or was it more so you guys were doing your thing? It was a business moving straight ahead, kind of. Good. That's a good question. You know, I told uh, when when Edgar White passed away, uh, great man. When Ed, he passed away last uh, June. Yeah. And. I was there and they asked me to talk on camera to do some memorials that they were going to have for memories. And I brought up the fact that I did not know when I was six and seven years old that anybody did what we did. So we were going to the coast and to get from Taylor Central Texas to the coast, we had to go through Lockhart. Mm -hmm. And my dad liked to eat at barbecue stands. And this was one of the first stands he ever brought me to was Blacks. And and I remembered I was a little nervous about it because I'd never eaten anybody else's barbecue. Because remember, I had Uncle Clem, Uncle Maurice, Uncle Jerry, Uncle Mike, Uncle Louie, and my dad. <laughs> they all had barbecue restaurants. And I remember sitting there thinking, I said, Dad, do we have to worry about this guy? You know, Is he hurting our business? And Dad said, no, there's plenty of business for barbecues. But no, I did not know that there was other people doing it. And the Black family was one of the first families. And, of course, in my hometown, Taylor, Texas, we had Louis Miller Barbecue. And yeah. we all know the history about them. Yeah, definitely. I know you worked at the restaurant. And you like, worked at, like, in, like, at the different restaurants. Now, you went off to college, correct? I went to be uh, – my father said, you know, son, and maybe you may want to have another plan. In case this barbecue <laughs> business doesn't work out. So I became a firefighter paramedic. I went into paramedic school and uh, also firefighting school. At Texas, I went to Texas Temple College for the, my paramedic and then Texas A&M for my firefighter. And I did that with all the other things that I did. I was a field paramedic for about, uh, I guess, six years with Williamson County EMS. And oh. I would work my four on and the 48 hours off, I'd be working for my dad. Oh, OK. Interesting. And then one day, dad said, that's enough of that. you got to go to work full time. <laughs> well, what year was that? Uh, I did that from 79, 78, 79 to 85. But I continued to teach paramedicine. I was a teacher of paramedicine for uh, the state, and I did examinations for state. I was a state examiner 
So I, I was very you know, involved in that for a long time. I, I was on the legislative committee that actually wrote some of the first EMS laws. And, you know, I look back on that and I, I wondered what my life would be like if I had stayed a paramedic. Who knows? Yeah, that's interesting. And, and at that time, were you guys selling, because I, I remember a story we had talked about a long time ago about brisket being, were you serving lean brisket? Were people, was that the time when people were super interested in just lean brisket? You know, I talk about this in my interview with, with Daniel Vaughn in Texas Monthly, that we went through this phase and from the 40s, of course, I don't remember that, but my dad told me up until around the early 70s, everything was fat. You look in a store and you see a ribeye, you want all the fat, you want all that. Same way with brisket, same way with barbecue. And then something happened in about 73 or so, 72, 73, it all went to lean. Okay. So it was lean from around 72 to about 2005 or so when this guy named uh, Aaron Frank. Have you heard of him? No, in passing, I've heard of him, yes. He's okay. I I hope he does well. I I wish him luck. (laughs) He's a great guy. (laughs) Yeah, he is, of course. I remember the the moment somebody told me, they said, hey, there's this guy that's got a trailer over by UT in Austin. Uh About a five, five, you really need to go eat some barbecue. And I go, well, I always love to eat barbecue. I went over there and he cooked, he had like half a brisket left mm-hmm. and he cooked, I think five or six. And I sat down and ate that brisket and I go, uh oh, <laughs> I said, this catches on. We're all going to have to change our ways because this is the, what I call full term brisket. In the, in our restaurant and catering business, we could not take a brisket to two, 203 or 205 degrees. We had to take it to about 190 and then hold it and travel with it. Okay. But what he was doing was taking so many briskets, cooking them to the full term, all the rendered fat, all the beautiful marble, all of that juiciness, and then serving all of them. In our case, if we cooked the brisket like that and we had some left over, we'd have to just, there'd be nothing left. Mm-hmm. And guess what? It caught on. <laughs> it's so interesting that, and, and, did you hear, were you hearing rumblings also too that this, this trailer had lines? Were you hearing, or was, I'm trying to, I'm, I'm trying to think of the history of how that kind of worked. I don't remember. Well, I, just... I got there, it was, he, he did not have a line. I was just sitting out there and he was such a nice, gracious young man. He was so young and very gracious. And he didn't know who I was and I sure as heck didn't tell him who I was. Mm-hmm. And, and I just know that when I ate it, I, I just remembered when I ate that brisket at Franklin's that first time in that little trailer, it brought back memories of when I was at home during the summer from school and my dad would bring that brisket wrapped up in butcher paper for my mom and I to enjoy. Oh, and really? he'd sit and unwrap it and then he'd cut it chunks like this and it was already fully cooked and so he couldn't take it back to there. You know, we had to eat it. That was amazing barbecue. Wow, that's so crazy. That's really interesting. Now, I call it retro, meaning old time. Full term. <laughs> Are you coining that phrase? Uh, I, 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 <laughs> I've never heard that. <laughs> According to Texas Monthly and Daniel Vaughn, you've heard of him, right? Oh, I've heard of Daniel Vaughn. <laughs> yeah, kind of Aaron guy. Uh, I kind of coined that retro full term. Okay. Well, I'll I'll have to. Maybe I could have like a little, uh, just a snippet, like a little teaser, like a uh, retro. What... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Do you need you need to like bumper stickers, like? <laughs> yeah. There you go. There's something. There's a business in there somewhere. We'll figure that out. That could be on the side. Uh, but now with the restaurants, like so, how how did the um, from from you coming back from from school and having having to work full time? What was what's the history of the restaurant of your restaurant, your family's restaurant? Well, you know, it, all of my dad's brothers and all of my cousins were pretty ra- pretty much raised the same way. We worked uh, at, at our at our parents' restaurant, and then after they passed on, we took those over and. I think one of the things, if you take a look at the history of the McKeska family, there was only a few people that could do what we could do. And that is, if you called me up in 19, between 1975 and 1995 mm-hmm. and say, hey, Tim, I've got 15,000 people to serve next week. 15,000. Uh, can you do it? I, I, and I would say, what time do you want? <laughs> what time? But time, because that's what we could do. Mm-hmm. I mean, South Texas Nuclear Project was 18,000 people. Uh, the Williamson County, Susquehanna, was, the Susquehanna was 12,500 people. I routinely catered six and seven and 8,000 people. Our weekends, we would do 10,000 people combined. 
And then if you look at our whole family, we would be doing 50 to 60,000 people a weekend. Oh, my Lord. So when I go, I was in a, I was in a restaurant not too long ago, and I asked him, how many brisket did you cook today? I said, man, we were, it was busy. And I said, how many did you cook? He said, it was crazy busy. I said, how many did you cook? He said, nine. <laughs> and I said, okay, that's good, man. Did you sell them all? Yeah, it sold them all. Good. We used to cook 600 every Friday. And I had to cook 600 every Saturday morning and 600 every Saturday afternoon. Oh, my gosh. Just, just for our catering business. Were you cooking those on offsets, or did you have pits? Or no. What? I had a pit. My dad helped design a pit a long, long time ago. Uh, called a Rotoflex. It was a it was a carousel. You know, everything kind of turns this way on the commercial carousels. Yeah. This one carouseled this way, like a like a regular old carousel. Okay. And it had a box for wood, and it had it was gas supported, and uh, it would cook a brisket in about six to eight hours. And it was a big commercial pit. Now you've got your Southern Pride, your old hick, your Hickories, your JRs, oh, yeah. and all that great stuff. But that was the first type of pit ever developed like that back in the sixties. Wow, that's so we had. On the mall, we had the whole family. I think had twenty eight of those pits. Told a thousand, a thousand pounds each. Each. Oh my god, that's a lot of meat. That's so much meat. Were you guys cooking sausage for the catering, or was it mostly brisket and? Oh, it was. It was it, well, we never catered without sausage because remember I told you about all this. Yes, sir. Money? Yes. Here, that was a very uh, a low margin for us. Uh, we made a you know we had a we had a very low cost in our sausage, mm -hmm. so if. We wanted to go catering. We needed sausage on that truck. Yes. Okay. That was, and so how long were you doing that that massive amount of catering? Was that for five, six, seven years, or until we got too dang old? No, we did that from the seventy mid seventies until uh, uh, the late nineties, okay. and we're still we still has catering business. My uncle still have that business. My cousins, I should say. But now, Kevin, when I was uh, you know still in my twenties back in the eighties, you would open up the Austin phone book, and there'd be five catering people in that whole phone book. <laughs> now they're 20 pages oh easily yeah so it's it's the competition started moving in and and uh, uh but you know what we had you know there's people could i mean we would be able to take barbecue to washington dc i mean i went to bosnia i went to germany i've been to the west coast i did the rodeo in las vegas all many times so we were able to take that barbecue and travel with it Excellent. So now, what, so how did your business change? Like when did the restaurant, when did you kind of leave that restaurant world and go into the, the world that you're in right now? The people changed. Okay. It wasn't, not my, not my customers, it was the, the ability to great. And I think if you talk to people that were in the business this, so many years, you'll hear them say the same thing. Uh, the labor force changed. Okay. Interesting. That's the labor, huge. Yeah. The labor force, we had people that were part of our family for 30 and 40 years. Uh, one of the ladies that worked with me for from the time I was little, she said, you know, my first job for this company was changing your diaper. <laughs> and I said, well, congratulations. You know, <laughs> I hope you don't stay long enough where you're going to have to change it again. <laughs> yeah, the full but, circle. <laughs> yeah, but when they, when they moved on, when they retired, you can't get the kind of people that work. My dad said, I never hired anybody. I worked with people. That's his attitude. He never hired staff. He never called them employees. They were his barbecue family. That's honorable. And, That's great. And, and, you know, you can't do that nowadays. There's very few people that can have that kind of a staff. And, and now we're, we're faced with high labor costs high food costs. Mm -hmm. Like that restaurant, I told you those fast food restaurants that are trying to sell, don't do that. Have I said that four times already? <laughs> yeah, this, we just won't say them by name, but yes. It's, yeah. It's, it's <laughs> yeah. I don't want to give yeah. them any press. <laughs> the drive through oh, you got to leave. Yeah, we heard about it. <laughs> exactly. So I decided to start a wholesale food company in okay. about eight, 2006 or so. Okay. So can you tell me about that? I'm very curious, and and also I, I think the viewers might want to know what's what's that behind your left, your t t behind you to your left? What is that? For my friends back in my hometown of Taylor, Texas, I have asked been asked this question so many times from 1970 until 2010. Mm -hmm. That stagecoach was in front of the restaurant. Okay, that's our famous brand, our stagecoach right there, and I wanted to have that in the background so I can prove to people that it's still here. It's here at the ranch, and uh, it has a lot of memories to it. Oh, it's beautiful. I love also in the fence. You have all the all the heads. The yeah, those are critters that have died. Uh, they, you know, the circle of life 
you're born and you die. Yes. And that's where we put them. This is like the, the the coolest setup I've ever seen in interview. <laughs> I am I'm 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 honored that you that you would set it up like this. So thank you. Thank it's you. My pleasure. Yeah. So tell me about your business. About your business. Well, I I started a, a sausage company called McKeska Brands. It started only as sausage, and it was being able to get my my products inspected under the USDA and be able to resell them to cust to you know the customers. Mm-hmm. And I really didn't have a whole lot of customers until one day this guy walks in. Uh, he Obviously, he didn't look like he was from Taylor. Mm-hmm. It was accompanied by another guy that definitely didn't look like he was from Taylor. And then another guy that all three of them were way off. Okay. Uh, but I invited him in. We talked. This guy's name was Barry Sorkin. Mm-hmm. The guy with him was Craig Goldwyn. He goes by Meathead. Meathead, yes. The guy was Andrew Bloom, who works with Wichita packing company a salesman and barry sorkin's from smoke barbecue but he wasn't but has his restaurant it was his restaurant open at the time or was it going he was going to open it he was on his the first time he came in it was actually with his uncle and another friend barry had been there before oh i didn't know that about his manifesto he told me about what he was doing and i said what what, what exactly are you doing and he says well you know i want to start this i'm going around all over the country i've been to the tennessees i've been to you know, the, all the, the Memphis, Tennessee area, look at that, that, Nashville. He's been to the to the East Coast and the Carolinas. He was getting all these barbecue genres together mm-hmm. and all over Texas. And he was going to bring all of this to one restaurant in Chicago. And I said, do you have a regular job? He, said, <laughs> he was an IT guy. Yeah. Making pretty decent. He's a pretty smart guy. <laughs> and I said, do you have your family? He hadn't started his family yet or nothing. And, uh, and I said, OK, well, you know, good luck. <laughs> And then he comes back about a year later, and he's got Meathead with him, Craig Goldwyn. Mm-hmm. They sat down, they tried my sausage, and they all three voted right then that, that they were going to use my sausage. And so he became my very first big customer. Very <laughs> And how did you? So you were shipping. Was that wasn't? I, there's a story too about the shipments to Chicago. Well, what happened was is it wasn't easy to ship product because Barry couldn't buy a, a whole truckload. Mm-hmm. You know, we ship you know, 30, 40,000 pound truckloads and he couldn't take that much sausage. Yeah. And so we were having difficulties getting product to him. Uh, he had, we actually used Southwest Airlines and we had so much sausage going on Southwest Airlines that one of the guys in the shipping department had little stickers that said hot gut airline. <laughs> I remember hearing about that. And yeah. They did a story on that. <laughs> and then, uh, and then we had issues too. I'm really big on customer service. Mm. And I think that's what's, it separates some of us from the others is our customer service. Oh, for sure. Barry, one particular, it, uh, I think it was, I remember exactly, it was January of 2009, had a serious ice storm. Ice storm had gone all the way to central Texas. Mm-hmm. I mean, we had an inch of ice in Taylor, Texas. The truck would not go to Chicago. We were now shipping by truck and it couldn't make it. It mm-hmm. can't go. And Barry had like four pounds of sausage left. I went to the plant. I had to take the ice and chip it off the back door to get my truck open to get all that sausage in my excursion. And I hauled 2,000 pounds. It took me 30 something hours to get from Taylor, Texas to Chicago with that load of sausage. See, that's customer service. That's the that's ID. But it was me. So I pulled up to Wichita Packing Company. And I mean, there was snow drifts 10 feet deep. And they call Barry. Andrew calls Barry and says, Hey, your sausage is here. I get a text from Barry. Said, "Oh my God, I don't know how you did it, but the sausage is here. Thank you so much." And I said, "Well, you're welcome." And then, ten minutes later, I walk into the restaurant. And he goes, well, what? I said, "They wouldn't go, Barry, so I can't." Oh, that's so great. That's and, and when I when I talked to Barry, he had a he had a very similar story, and it was just yeah he 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 had never heard of someone ever doing that, and that's. And and of course that's you 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 have a relationship with, with him for life regardless, but that definitely solidifies that shows the you know go the extra mile. I hope you stayed overnight. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, it was so cold in Chicago; it was nine degrees that uh, I had to yeah, I had to go get a, a heater from my hotel room. <laughs> but did he tell you about the other customer service thing that I did about uh-uh. the customer, Audi customer? No. I was there about a, a year or two. Uh, Actually, this was before that, when he had one of his grand openings, when he first debuted my product. Okay. I was there. I, you know, I didn't haul sausage. We had it shipped. And it was really his first couple of 
month or so, I guess, in the restaurant business. Mm-hmm. And he had a, a shirtless guy who was kind of causing issues come in. And, and anyway, uh, I got him out. And I got him out the way we do in Texas. <laughs> I, I grabbed him by his britches and his hair, and I pulled him to the street. <laughs> and then everybody was like, oh, my God, you know. <laughs> and then the cop shows up, and then they go, uh, I said, yeah, this is, you know, I got him out there. He was being disrespectful, and I got him out. Well, he, was, he actually was wanted for robbery, so <laughs> I did this favor. And then Barry was just like, oh, my God. I mean, it was like John Wayne. And I go, <laughs> it's a Texas. Between Texas and Chicago. <laughs> Texas and everywhere. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Probably. So tell, yeah. Me, so tell me what, tell me what you guys make. Because it's 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 fascinating and it's 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 wonderful. I've I've had your sausage. I worked at a restaurant prior that we were selling your sausage and it was phenomenal. So please, yeah, please tell me. The number one selling sausage we have is a spicy pork sausage. It's extremely lean. It's uh it's about eighty percent lean sausage. It has no fillers in it. It's smoked over hardwood too. A lot of these commercial sausage sausage plants have what we call hopper injected the mm-hmm. smoke, but this is hardwood fueled uh, sausage. Uh, the next most popular is the same pork sausage with jalapeno and cheddar cheese. And then we have a, our, our beef sausage. We don't make a straight 100% beef sausage. We make an 80-20. It's 80% beef and 20% pork. And it's a, a very lean product, too. And it's more of this old hot gut style. Okay. And then we also have that with jalapeno and cheese. So my four most popular sausages my, is my pork sausage, spicy pork, and then my beef 80-20. We do turkey sausage. We do custom sausages also for other people. But that's the most, probably the most popular. And you guys also do brisket too, don't you? Do a couple. Of yeah, I have customers. We do the entire package for them. We do the, the whole pork shoulder, the entire the picnic shoulder for the for pork. But they can take that whole shoulder. It's cryovac, fully cooked. All they have to do is reheat it and chop it up. Brisket and ribs and everything. And you sell to specifically to restaurants. It's not. It's not retail. Yeah, that, that's we only sell wholesale to distributors or direct to restaurants. I don't, I was in the grocery store business briefly, and I didn't like it. Mm-hmm. I, I thought it had a little bit of a devaluing product when people go to a restaurant and they see a sausage, and then they go to the grocery store and they see the same sausage. I, I don't know. I would prefer just to do the restaurant. So, Tim, I'm, what I'm going to do for sure, I'm going to put a link below and, and some information so people – because – as you know, Central Texas style barbecue is spreading across the United States. There are Central Texas style barbecue joints everywhere, even outside of the United States. So I know that there's a lot of people that want to be able to offer sausage, and maybe they might have a hot link. They might have something that's local to them. But if they want to have you, you guys do ship, and I can put, I'll put links to to your uh, to your website so that way people would know. And and size wise, if a restaurant wants to know how much they need to order, is there a, there, there are minimums, correct? Well. What I'm suggesting now is it's very difficult to ship direct because so many of these restaurants, Kevin, can't meet the demand, can't For meet sure. the quantity requirements. So I'm telling them to go to Cisco. Okay. So you have a relationship with Cisco. So that's, that's yeah. fantastic. Excellent. Yeah. So what else, what else should people know about your business, about the, the McKeska brands? Well, I believe it's about the people. I believe it's about our family. Uh, what makes us different, I believe, than anybody that's in the host of food business that's relating to barbecue is the fact that we've been doing it for so long. And we believe in our products and we believe in the people that we support. When a restaurant buys a product from us, when they put their sausage on, our sausage on their menu, they are now part of the first family of Texas barbecue. In 1985, Texas Monthly. Uh, named us the first family of Texas barbecue, and uh, we've been holding on to that for, for that many years. And so, when you buy a product from us, you're getting also that that good faith value. What does barbecue mean to you? Like, what does when someone says like, if someone came to you and said, Tim, what does barbecue mean to you? What does that world? What is the barbecue world? And how has that barbecue world changed too for you? It's a good question. Uh, I've been asked that recently, I, just as long, I think it was like uh, back in December, I was asked, you know, what does all of this mean to you? Yeah. Uh, to me, it's part of my life. And so there wasn't a time when I wasn't around barbecue. There wasn't a time when I wasn't around meat. And so this is just a part of my everyday life, providing great food and great products to people. I think the things that make barbecue different than, say, pizza or pasta is the fact that all these pit masters 
there's very little competition and jealousy. They are all very close. And Mike Mills, the famous Mike Mills from 17th Street, he's yes. got to say, the pasta people don't get together like this. No, they don't. We have barbecue festivals. We are all there and we're having a great time. And it's a big family. But you got to get 15 or 20 Italians together to try to get grandma's recipe for their sauce. And you're going to have you're going to have a bad fight, right? Yeah. The barbecue business to me means family. And it means, and I, and it means I can make a call to any of those people if I needed help and they would be there. And I, and I know they would. And it's, it also feels like that barbie, those, it's a, it's a family in, in the, as much as people too are accessible. Like, like I could come up to you and talk to you. Whereas if there's a lot of chefs that don't want to talk to the public or they don't want to be bothered by it. And I feel like the bar, like these, some of these great pit masters, people like you that, that have a con that are iconic, you can come up to, to Tim McKeska and talk to him and ask him questions. And I feel like you'd be just as gracious to anybody across the board. And that's, that's what makes it special to me. That's exactly, and that's exactly right. And I will do that. And my dad did that. Uh, he, he did that all the time. And, and that's, that's what made us, I think, and that's, what's great about our business. And don't you think it's kind of funny too, that it's, it's almost seems like how like the, the, the older baseball players or the older basketball players, they didn't get the accolades, nor did they get the paychecks that people get like that. It seems like it's, there's rock star status for a lot of barbecue people that didn't exist back then. And the, the lines, people wait two, three hours. How long would people wait in line at the restaurants that you worked at as a kid? How long would they wait? Cause we moved, we, we, we had multiple cooks all day long. So we had to be open from, you know, 10 o'clock in the morning to eight o'clock at night. So we didn't have those long lines except at lunch. Uh, there is a rock star status. And I, I use Vince Mars as a great example. My old friend, Vince Mars. When you go into Taylor Cafe, it's like he's the Pope sitting there in that chair. That's, that's true. They all want to talk to him. Uh -huh. They all want to shake his hand. And I know Wayne Miller's got the same thing when people, they always want to talk and Wayne's busy, uh, but he'll stop and talk. Uh -huh. And so will Aaron. And so all, and Barry Sorkin too, all, he'll, they'll stop and talk. And Myron Mixon, all those big pit masters you see on TV, they're very gracious. Uh -huh. They may be a little intense in their competition, but they're very gracious. Uh -huh. and, it's, it's, and it seems like, and I guess too, like if you use the sports analogy, the, the ones that are close to their fans or talk to their fans seem to be, to have a bigger fan base. If it's NASCAR or if it's anything, it's some, if they're gracious with their fans then you know, they get with, they understand that without the customers, there's no business in general. So, Yes. And, I, and there's another thing that's changed about our business too, that makes it totally different. I can't take this phone off and turn it around and show it to you. But everybody that's got that little smartphone, mm -hmm. they all become a super barbecue critic. <laughs> oh, for sure. Because they got Yelp and Yahoo and all these things that you can make, you can criticize things with. And uh, so now the days of mediocre barbecue is over with, Kevin. You have to put out a great, the days of mediocre anything is over with. You've got to put out a great product all the time and make customers happy all the time. And what do you, Tim, think about the way the barbecue has changed, how there's a lot of kind of like either Tex-Mex flares or there's more chef-driven barbecue? Because there's pla there are places, it seems like, th around Austin and, and Houston that are even changing, too. It's ba Valentina's Tex-Mex. Mm -hmm. Have you ever been to have had that? I, no, but I want to. I've, I've heard great. Uh, yeah. I mean, it's a it's a flair of, of the Hispanic culture and barbecue. And I, I, I've never, never thought about taking a piece of brisket with peppers and put it on a fresh tortilla with salsa. Why didn't I think of that? <laughs> Why did all of us think of that? It was amazing. And then people like Brotherton over in Pflugerville, Brotherton's Black Iron Barbecue, who does this thing I just saw the other day I ate, was crazy, was it was chopped, barbecue, chopped brisket on a grilled cheese sandwich. Oh, it had two so. types of grilled cheese on a big Texas toast, grilled cheese with brisket. And the brisket was all melted into that. Oh, that's cheese. genius. That sounds so crazy. Good. So I'm, I'm, it's very exciting time to be in this business. It's changing. Uh, I don't know where it's going. People have asked me, "Hey, is this a fad?" I don't know. I, I don't know. Yeah, we don't. We don't know. But I and I think that's that's another reason why I, I like to do this is because I want because of what, what where the barbecue world is right now, I want to document the entire world because it's so intriguing to me. We're at like such a and like they, like Texas Monthly said, it's the golden age of barbecue. It really is. Yeah, I mean, do people know your history? Your history? Uh, not, not hundred <laughs> percent. So they just see you as a talking head on YouTube, and no, 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 they, they, they know my background. I, I give it, but I don't give the. Um, 
All of it. <laughs> they don't know all of it, right? No. All right, people, forget him for a second, okay? Kevin was in the trenches of Texas Barbecue. He was in the trenches. And I'm not going to go into details of those trenches, but he worked in the trenches of Texas Barbecue when it was still in this transition state. What, what's that, seven years ago? Six, seven, maybe? I think about seven, yeah. Seven, yeah, seven, yeah. yeah. So he's, he is telling you from experience, uh, uh, he, and I, I really appreciate that about you because I get a lot of interviews and a lot of people will spend an hour or two reading about barbecue and then want to interview me. You have a lot of history because you've been in those trenches and you've seen the internal difficulties of trying to create great products mm -hmm. and the dynamics. There's a lot of dynamics that go into that. A lot of dynamics. Being able to keep a barbecue restaurant running properly. Mm -hmm. and ah, well, thank you. And I, no, and I, uh, and it, if it wasn't for that situation, like for what I've learned from that, I wouldn't have met you. And that's what's made it even more yeah. special. Okay, you with me? I am. So where are we going? Going into the uh, our locker right here. Hold on. Oops. Perfect. Maybe a little hard to hear, but I'll tell you what. This is the rest. This is the round primal, the back end of the animal. Okay. And then here is your loin primal, and then your rib primal is right there. Oh, cool. These are the plate ribs. Most of the plate ribs that you need in your restaurants now come off of this center plate right here. Here is your ribeye, and then here is your loin, here is your tender loin, and then here is your round. Can you see that okay? Oh, perfect. Perfect. Uh, now, you in California, in California, y'all are really big on tri-tip, right? Yes, sir. You know where it comes from? Mm-hmm. No, I don't. Do you know where it comes from the animal? <laughs> right here would be your tri tip. Okay. Here is the top of the sirloin, and here is the bottom of the sirloin. So your tri tip sits right here, right at that junction. And remember, this is bison. This is American bison or buffalo. So you notice how lean it is. Super lean. That's why it's so expensive. Okay. Okay. And then here would be your, your tenderloin. And if you were to cut this with a saw, here would be your T-bones. Oh, wow. Okay. Let me get out of here real quick because it's a little cool. Those animals were going to hang in there for uh, a total of about 18 days. We normally hang beef cattle 21 days okay. on the rail. And here we do buffalo and elk for about 14 to 18 days and this is our just our ranch processing this is not our federal processing okay. that we do our sausage okay this is just the ranch operation and to show you we're serious to show you that we are serious about smoking our pit here that holds 500 pounds oh man wow <laughs> nice. And that's where we smoke all of our sausage, uh, our cryback. This is the hopper where the smoke comes out of the sawdust in here. The sawdust here goes down into a element that spins and then injects smoke into that smokehouse. Uh, our equipment to make sausage is all here. Our stuffers. Those. So anyway, this is where. I love to cut meat at right here. That's your spot? That's my spot. <laughs> we have a Southern Pride on the back. You want to see the Southern Pride? Oh, yeah. I'd love to. Yeah. Okay. On these exotic proteins we have here, one of the best things I tell people to do is to do hamburger. I mean, we can produce an animal like that buffalo will probably have 200 pounds of lean hamburger. And if you were trying to go to Whole Foods and buy five pounds of buffalo hamburger, you see how much it costs. Oh, yeah. So we tell a lot of our customers here that come out to the ranch to, uh, to concentrate a lot on the, on the hamburger because you can do a lot with hamburger. Wow, that's really great. So we all process all the sausage. These are snack sticks. Oh, that's great. Oh, that's cool. Of course, a lot of sausage, all of that. 
and I think we're, we have enough lights in here now to show you. And this is our southern pride that we have here at the ranch. Oh, so nice. This is a 500 pound model here. So, what do you think? I think it's fantastic. I think that was great. I really appreciate it all. And and maybe sometime, what maybe we could even do a, a separate one where we I film you making sausage. Oh, that'd be good. Let me go back outside because the scooter in here is is cooking. Hold on. There we go. Well, thank you so much, and have a great rest of your week. All right, thank you. Take care. <laughs> That's it. This is the first load of it. We'll be doing this for the next three days, all day long.